Hi everybody, this is Scott Park Phillips and I, this is an interview with Serge Dreyer in Taiwan and I'm in Colorado and the connection was really bad at first and what you'll see here is after that it was fixed but we were really, oh no, is it going to work, is it going to work? So I say um like about a thousand times. Also, I saw a... Uh, a really large cougar that morning so I was kind of excited anyway uh, please excuse all the ums I think you'll really enjoy it the ums end after about the first half hour it's a really fun interview also you can check me out at Scott Park Phillips Substack now and hopefully it works um, this is Good. Serge Dreyer I hope I'm pronouncing that right um, Oh, it's okay. It's <laughs> You're used to it, <laughs> speaking to yeah. Americans. Uh, and this is Scott Park Phillips. And uh, Serge is an anthropologist, is that correct, in, in Taiwan? Not, um, not exactly. Um, um, in my field, I have to use a lot of anthropology, uh, but also history, uh, uh, psychosociology, sociology. I'm a specialist of didactic of cultures. I mean, my job is to, is to, uh, my training is to especially uh, research about intercultural communication, uh, dealing with foreigners, dealing with foreigners' culture and, and, and all that uh, stuff. But in our field, we use a lot uh, of anthropology and I'm very fond of it. So in a way, you're right. It, 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 is that a, is that a, a, a a subfield of, of diplomatic studies or international relations? Mm, not no. at all, not at all. It could be used, it could be used in, in, into that. It's mostly oriented toward uh, teaching French as a foreign language, like you have TEFL in English. Uh, so I, I teach language to, to make a living, but my, my research is mostly about uh, culture and especially intercultural uh, communication. But of course it, it it will be used in diplomacy, and so if it will be used properly, we probably uh, might have less problems nowadays uh, than we have. So uh, it was wonderful of you to write to me uh, after watching the Mark Muhlenfeld um, interview, and, and you posed such fantastic questions, I thought we should talk in person and, and go over them and maybe share those questions more broadly, um, because... Uh, my sure. own my own work has has uh, has you know I've been blessed in, in incredibly by the the people who write to me the 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 intellect and the integrity and the and the fascination and the the the, the, um, the passion or the in the interest the deep interest of all the people who have written to me has been fantastic but in the broader scheme of things well, it's I have probably to because. Broader. No, I was about to say it's probably also coming from you. I mean, you, you <laughs> seem to be an open guy and, and that motivate people. I wouldn't have written you if I had felt that uh, you were this kind of stubborn people ju just looking at one direction in life. I'm not interested into that. Oh, well, well thank you. Yeah, and, and so, but, but you offered some really interesting critiques. So I wanted to get into that and you seem particularly well-informed. <laughs> so that was awesome. Um, you're a Tai Chi teacher as well and as you have yeah. a um Zhang also. Zhang and Xing Yichuan. and you're that's fantastic and you're also working on um a push hands book or you're about to publish is that correct yes 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 but in fact push hands is my my main interest uh when i arrived in taiwan in 1976 i was a semi-professional football player I mean, European football, uh, soccer. Uh, I didn't know anything about martial arts. And by chance, I met someone who took me to a class. Uh, and the slow movement, they were of no interest for me, but while I could see people very soft. And what prevented me from becoming a, a professional player is that my lack of softness. And I started Tai Chi because of this, but I will have probably uh, not practice a long time if only the slow movement. But when, when I came to pushing ends, 
Right. Uh, um, yeah. So, so I, I really appreciate the football connection because I, uh, I, being an American, I, I never played football, uh, but, but I, um, during COVID, I was, I've been part of a, a Ghanaian dance group and I was desperate to, to start the dance all after we closed things down, I kept calling the head of the dance company that I'm in and saying, let's start. And he kept saying no. And, uh, and then he said, you know what, do you want to come play soccer with us? So I went and played soccer with all these Africans. Of course, I was like a little child compared to them. But, <laughs> but it was they're good at it. The Africans are very good at it. Oh, the Ghanaians, especially. Um, but yeah, quite, quite a fun, um, quite a fun thing to do. Uh, and gave me a lot of appreciation for how they think about it. And, and we played with music, so it was very African in that sense. But maybe you heard uh, one of the best players of history, Zinedine Zidane, uh, was playing for Madrid, a huge, huge star. And uh, Beckham, who is, I guess, is famous in, in, in the States, uh, said, well, when Zinedine Zidane play play soccer, is like a ballet dancer. So that should be meaningful for you. <laughs> it is, it is indeed. Well, let let's. Uh, so I really want to do want to talk about your your research, maybe, and also your book. But let's jump to those questions. I'm gonna just put them up on the screen so people can see them, uh, and then and we'll go through them. Uh, here we are, my screen. Uh, just a second. Uh, so you mentioned all these people. People can, of course, pause this video and uh, and take a look at and if we, you know, if I'm going too fast through it. Um, you mentioned all these different people. I just talked with Georges Favart, uh, or sent he sent me an email saying he was sending the Mark Muhlenbell video to uh, Fiorella here um yeah yeah oh uh, which is she's a good friend of mine wow it's really great um i also had a chance to read alan arroz book uh which is which which really expands on that one element of of mark muhlenbelt's um uh work of uh, you know w what is it to have talismans inside of a deity, uh, so we could talk about that more. But uh, it it's uh, it's really quite uh, a really quite remarkable book. I was uh, it's just new if people aren't familiar with it. it's. Uh, well, I don't have it right here. It's it's called Occultic Images in China. Uh, mm -hmm. So so the the first question you asked was about uh, was maybe for Mark directly, but about um, what types of Militias we were talking about. So there are the Songjiang uh, militias that are well known in uh, in Taiwan uh, because they've been part of a revival. Uh, yeah, but uh, just 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 one point, Scott. Uh, usually in Chinese, we don't talk uh, about the Songjiang as a militia. We just talk about them as a troop. It's it's for me it's very different because the Songjiang. Uh, were not really used to fight. They were used to fight against demons, ghosts, and so on. But militia, what I'm talking about, real militia are for fighting, protecting, and so on. So for me, that's, that makes a difference. Right. And I don't I, know if you agree about that. but Oh, I agree. Yeah. Um, but P Perry, I was, I was mentioning that the... Uh, well, you mentioned here Crimson Rain, but also uh, Perry... It's in my book here. Uh, what's her name? Uh, yeah, oh, what's her first name? Perry. She she wrote a lot about. She was really doing research about why why China um, why a revolution happened. You know, that was sort of her her fundamental question. Elizabeth Perry. So she wrote in Elizabeth in Perry. Yeah, in 1980, she has a book called Rebels and Revolutionaries in North China, and it really deals with this sort of 
this question about what what were the militias and and she mostly puts the religious material in footnotes but they were organized um around uh uh function yani around the the play with naja um and so we don't you know and she calls them red spears is her generic term but they had many many different names and so it's a little bit hard. I mean, this is why I asked that question directly to to uh, to Muhlenbelt, uh, you know, what is a militia? And I feel like that's also because you mentioned um, Borat's here. Um, we really should uh, keep asking that question. I, I think it's still open. But, the, the, you know, the thing is, what is very difficult uh, when I was a student in uh, uh, Langs Oriental in, in Paris. I had a teacher who was a specialist of secret societies and, and, and I was very fascinated by that. And it's very difficult often in, in, in China to make the difference between political oriented secret society, uh, revolutionary society or, or, or more fighting militia gangsters uh, and also the Jianghu people, what we call the people in the lakes and, 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 and rivers. And sometimes those names have changed with time. Uh, for example, in 19th century, the Jianghu Ren, uh, they were more, uh, and also, again, to speak of illegal in, in, in China, you have to be very cautious because it's very different from, from uh, the West. Uh, but they were much more aggressive. Now, the Jungle people are, at least in Taiwan, like it has been studied beautifully by uh, Boris. They mostly, it's mostly an attitude which is between, they're not gangsters, they're not ordinary people, uh, but they tend to help each other. They tend to help people who are in trouble. So there is a moral dimension now, uh, which was slightly different in the 19th century. And if you think about the secret societies, uh, the, the, what we call the, the Rei, Rei Tao in, in Taiwan, the gangsters, they often have rituals, which looks like secret societies, but they are real gangsters. Uh, and we have plenty, and many of them. Also, the, the very interesting thing, I have one very good friend of mine, of course, I, I, won't, I won't tell here publicly who he is and where he is, but uh, he's a Jianghu and, and he's a go-between gangsters and the police in, in, in Taiwan. And it tells me, uh, and that has been also beautifully uh, described in a PhD thesis in France by a Taiwanese. Most of the popular cults in Taiwan the temples are under the influence of the gangsters. And he explained that to me very, very simply. He said, for example, if you, Scott, you want to buy, uh, you know, the, the very important prestigious object that you have in temple is a incense, uh, how you will say that in English? You know, burner. the big incense. incense uh, burner. burner. Right, yeah. right, right. <clears throat> and if you, uh, you know, the, the head of a big family, you want to buy that, and so of course your name, prestige, and so on is associated with that. Then I want it too because I'm also a powerful man. So if you have the power in the temple, then I put trouble in the temple. I will send my guys, or I will find any way to to put you in trouble. And of course, if I take the power, you will do the same. So in the end, what people did, they call the gangsters. And for example, one the, the one of the biggest. Uh, um, procession in Taiwan that Fiorella Aliu knows very well. She's she's really uh, incredible, incredibly knowledgeable about that. Uh, this is a famous gangster who is running the the, the temple, and the one is the one inviting uh, you know the 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 a general troop and 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 so on. Uh, so religion, politic, gangsters. It's not that clear. Can, that, that's incredible. Can you can you say the name of the that temple and also the name of the the uh, the paper that was written in French? Uh, the the temple is in Tajia. In the, it's in a suburb of Taichung. Uh -huh. It's very well known. And 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 I can tell you stories about like that, which which are quite incredible for 
the, the Western logic. Uh, this guy is, is a very famous gangster in, in Taiwan. Everybody knows uh, about him. But uh, the gangsters in Taiwan, the Heita, we call that the Black Way. Uh, yeah. Tao of, yeah. uh, Tao de Jing. The Tao of Black, yeah. Right, right. And, and which is opposed to the White Tao, by Tao who are the judge, the police, and, and, and so on. Um, and the, the government, all the governments, they know him. And for example, the former president of, of Taiwan, he will come during this big process where about 200,000 people uh, join and so on. It's, it's a huge stuff. And uh, it will come because it's important. If it gives prestige, if it gives face to this gangster, then in exchange, the gangster will call the people to vote for him. But in the same time, the same president who is looking for this guy to get vote, and the gangster who, is, who welcomes the president for, for his help. In the same time, the president, uh, as a special policeman, following everywhere this gangster, I've met this guy, and if the gangsters do something clearly illegal, then he put him in jail. So it's a, it's a game of pull push. Um, there's no definitely a bad guy and a good guy. It's all into a kind of pushing ends game. You know you know how to push, right? Yeah. <laughs> you yeah, absorb yeah. the pushing. You push back, and 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 right. Do, do That's you, what it is. Do you have the name of the Taiwanese um, uh, author who wrote about about this connection in in? Uh... Yes, uh, I will send it to you because Great, I have that's a fine. very poor memory uh, name. And the funny story about this guy, I, I know him very well. He speaks French fluently, he's, he's very good. The very funny story. He wrote his PhD thesis about how the gangsters rule the uh, popular cult temple in Taiwan. His elder brother is a, a police officer and his younger brother is a gangster. <laughs> and himself is a guy writing about about this topic and of course he's an expert about it I, and it's, it's it's very interesting i have i have a couple things to say about that one i i have uh there's a taiwanese movie about gangsters called it's called something like mambo something i forget mom it's got yeah, maybe, mambo. maybe but but it, it is a it is very interesting about you know the it, it follows the gangster families and their you know, as, as a kind of intimate story, and it, it involves the temples. Um, there's also a documentary that was made uh, that I saw years ago now on the, uh, the Lantern Festival, where you can see all sorts of amazing footage of uh, the, the um, gangster. I, I, one gangster gets picked to wear a motorcycle helmet and leather jacket, and he's put up on a float, and everyone throws firecrackers at him as a kind of public retribution ritual, um, which is, un I mean, this stuff is phenomenal. I, I have one more thing to say about this, which is that I, I don't know if you're familiar with um, uh, Robinson's, I forget his first name, Robinson wrote a book about, uh, it's called uh, uh, gang, uh, Bandits, Eunuchs, and the Son of Heaven, I think. And it, it's a, it does cover sort of Ming Dynasty malicious. It's an attempt to, to explore that. And um, David Robinson, I believe is his name. It, it's, all, it's also fairly okay, old. Uh, please, please, in, in exchange, send me the reference. I, I'll be interested. Yeah, uh, I will. And, and you know, it's, it's an early work. It doesn't, again, doesn't really acknowledge the religious connection, but the book starts with an event, which is a kind of soccer game. Um, they were playing a version of soccer where the, the, the hole is on the wall. Uh, and yeah. and uh, the emperor is playing with a bandit chief. You know, and the, the, it starts in and the, the sort of he says how he, the basis for the book really is how did this happen and what does it mean? You know, how is it the, the bandit chief is playing soccer with the emperor and what does it mean? So I just really thought of that when you were describing the, the president of Taiwan and a gangster. Yeah, but don't, don't, don't forget one thing. Uh, if you look at the history of, a, of a, the Chinese empire, some of the guy who reached the top, they were not nice guys. 
And, no, and, and they were, no, no, they were not right? nice guys. No. Right. So, so uh, closely associated with Bandit, why not? I mean, it, it, it's, it's a thing with, which is fascinating and which is difficult for us Westerners, when, especially when you arrive in this, uh, in this kind of country. It's, uh, we, we use in, in, in a Western world, you know, white is white, black is black, and, and, and like the song said, and, and we're not very at ease to deal with the in-between, where in Chinese, they, they use a word, I, I like it very much, and now I understand fully because it's part of my life, mohu, which means uh, blurring. You know, it's, it's just, they, 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 Chinese very easily get into this in between, for example, when they, when they talk about uh, going through the back door, ho men, it's uh -huh. part of life. If you don't know how to, to, to go through the back door, you don't survive in Chinese. Uh, and so you need connection. And so when you have a problem uh, and, and something that also, which is difficult for us to, to, to think about is, in the West, for good or for bad, but we have rules and we try to, you know, follow the rules. Not everybody, but at least. So, for example, when you walk on a on a on a sidewalk, either in the states or in France, you have your space, right? The the space for the car is on the street, and the space for the walkers is on the sidewalk. In Taiwan and even in China, the space is on sidewalk. The people put their You've been to Taiwan. They put their parts. They put their motorcycles. They put uh, even block the, the, the sidewalk. So you always, at every minute in this world, you have to adapt. You have to not to think in terms. It's my right. You should not prevent me from walking on the sidewalk. No, <laughs> you you just walk on the street and then <laughs> you, you you deal with uh, with with the situation constantly because of the space, because of the rules, because of, of people's habits. So this notion of bad guys, good guys, sometimes you, you are the good guys, sometimes you are the bad guys, and sometimes when you don't have any way to solve your problem, you call a gangster. Yeah. That's, yeah. That, it's, yeah. Everybody knows about it in, in, in Taiwan. You call the big guy, and, and, and we had this in Europe, and I guess you have that in the States, when people are in debt, you cannot get your money back through the police, but some guys call the the the, the big bully, right? Oh, uh, oh yeah. Well, so, of course. I, um, my father was involved in inventing the credit card, so the the um, the what we call the American Express card, uh, and in it was really the first. It wasn't a formally a, a, a national uh, bank linked credit card. It was a smaller arrangement, um, and in Chicago. They had a they had a contract with the mob, for anybody you know the, the credit card company had a contract with the mob, you know the sixties, in case they needed to get some money back. Um, yeah, it's it's yeah. Of but course the big di normal. the big difference, the big difference between the American mobs and the Italian mobs and the Chinese one. I've been living in 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 USSR uh, in nineteen seventy nine, and I saw saw the mobs there. The big difference is the Chinese are very smart. They don't uh, look for trouble to ordinary people. They don't don't look for trouble to you know small shops. They don't racket. They they just racket all the illegal business, and they have their own business. Like the guy I've told you about uh, in this temple, he he runs a company for the how you call that the asphalt on the road, you know, yes. the black stuff. How you call yeah. that? Yeah, yeah, that's right. And. He has a monopoly of that. So if you want to build a road, everybody knows you have to go through, through, through this guy. But he won't bother you with your small business or your ordinary life. So it's it's a culture. It's part of a culture, and it's fascinating. Yeah, that's really wonderful. Um, and uh, okay, so we can come back to that because you clearly have some some great insights there, and and. Uh... But I wanted to see if we can get through this. Well, this this is an interesting point you made here, which is that it's it's difficult to talk about what the average you know Chinese villager. You know, if we sort of posit that there's this average Chinese villager that had some connection to to military action, it's it's a problem because most didn't unless they were 
conscripted, as you say. And so, but, but I think we, I think just, I think we kind of covered this already, which is that they had a relationship to bandits and they had, you know, the, one of the functions of the fa uh, and I think this, this has come out in some recent research. Um, one of the functions of the fa was to, uh, was to organize um, bandit responses, which we, which we maybe call militias, but they, they weren't quite so organized as what we think of as a militia. They were just superior numbers going after bandits, um, you know, essentially a tit for tat game because the bandits could also be a, a, a neighboring village or they might or might not be. Um, and so I think that's more closer to what we're, we're thinking about when we think about the where martial arts fit in a village context. But, you know, the, 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 there are a lot of things that that's what I'm, I'm, I'm working on about just to um, try to make people understand that uh, Tai Chi Chuan was not born as a philosophy, uh, Taoist religion or whatever. Um, you know, when you read, and I, I'm sure you know uh, very well, the Jack Chen who, who translated the fist, the Chuan Jing, the, 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 the classical of boxing, which has been written in the uh, 16th century by the famous general Qi Ji Guang. Yes. Did you hear about that? Yes, okay. I've written about it myself. And, uh, yeah. It, it, I find the book very good because it connects very ancient practice to very modern practice of like in you know, a military and police and so on. And uh, very early as far uh, as, as we know, and as far as I know, my, my knowledge is, is limited, of course. Uh, we should never forget that martial arts were closely linked to violence. And this violence was expressed in many ways, but uh, like you mentioned, the farmers, people in a the village, they were conscripted. They didn't have military skill as far as we know. There's a very good book about the, the training of the military and soldiers about during the Qing dynasty. Uh, and, and so these guys, they didn't have really great technical skill, but the army was a place where they will meet other people with a lot of skills. And also something that we should never forget to understand how many martial arts were created, and I believe Tai Chuan is part of it. Uh, see, when you're a soldier, you're under the order of your officer, a general. Uh, suddenly, he gives you the order, okay, let the enemy go through. And once you are into his back, kill them. Then for this guy, if they have any common sense, any intelligence of the field of fighting. When they go back to the village, either they organize a militia and they use this tactic in their own way. Yeah. And if they have an understanding of martial art, if they are interested by fighting, and if martial art is a good way for them to make a living in a village or to get respect, which is also very important, then they, their experience of war, they can put it, because the, the very thing which really uh, has always surprised me is that how come that Chinese are the only one or nearly the only one to have invented such martial arts where you definitely use the strengths of others. When, where you let them come, you, you don't go against the tide. It's, it's really incredible. And uh, I'm sure all, all the pra practitioners of Tai Chi Chuan or Sing Chen or Pai Wajon or many or even external martial arts. Uh, it's really a trademark of the Chinese, which of course uh, went to, 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 to Japan. In the West, we didn't, we didn't think about uh, martial arts like that. And probably it was the influence of the Greek and, and the Roman, uh, which were met, mostly put forward the social value of heroism, courage, and, and never be afraid of, of, of death. When Sun Tzu, especially uh, Sun Tzu and Sun Bing, they started to think when they saw so many thousand, hundred thousand people killed during the, the how you call that in English, uh, the Zhang War. Uh, it's a 
the, the, the warring uh, states between the warring states period yes yeah. yes and they 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 and very smartly they think okay we have to change that we cannot go on uh, like that so different different direction were, were, were taken. But I think the connection between the military and martial arts is very strong. Uh, and the militia is also very strong, but it's all the same family. And then it started to change really in the 19th century with under the influence of the defeat by, by Western powers. Uh, the Boxer Rebellion was also a, a tick point. Uh, and then the, the, the scholars started to to, to think about that. And we have this example, this, the same situation in France. Uh, at the end, in 1870, we were uh, badly defeated by the German, of, uh, the Prussian, Prussian at that time. And uh, Napoleon III was captured and we had to pay a lot and so on. And it was a huge traumatism for the French, which explained in part the First World War to take the, 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 the revenge. But what they did after Napoleon III was captured, they imposed physical education in class to prepare uh, you know, young lights for, 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 for fighting. And the Chinese did exactly the same. When you read Zhen Manqing and all these guys, Sun Lutong and all that, they're saying the same thing. We were the sick men of Asia. We have to get strong. So, but these are scholars who started to think like that and to transform the martial art in their own way because in their world, martial arts is no culture. So they had to make it in such a way that doing martial arts was also for intelligent, smart people, of course, in 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 in, in color. Right. So I, I think it's it's we should not forget this 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 origin. Okay. It's my you, explanation. I I disagree with some of what you said, but of course, most of what you said I actually agree with. So well, I would like to parse that a bit uh, because. But but I, I wanted to just back up for a second. And because you say that that you you and, the, and this is I don't actually intend to have this conversation. I just wanted people who are listening to to think about it. You you said that um, you know, there's something very unique about Taiji. And I and I do agree with that, but it's not necessarily as new uh, Taiji is unique. Um, the, the internal martial arts are unique, I think, to China, but the uh, the idea of using the other the opponent's strength. Um, I highly recommend this book by T.J. Obi. Um, it's called Fighting for Honor, uh, and it's about African martial arts in the Americas. And it's a, I, I recommend it specifically because it's such a good model about how to think about martial arts in a broader context. It makes it. it it's really. Uh, and of course, the the, um, the Africans um, had elaborate strategies <laughs> that they incorporated into their martial arts that are um, based on on uh, on deception and using the other the, the power of the other as well, and inverting things. Um, so, but that's just a side issue. Um, I you brought you're now we're on to this on on to the uh, the fourth and fifth question here. So. Uh, Let's dive in. Uh, well, the fourth question for people you can hit pause was just about the nature of violence um, and Tai Chi's relationship to it. And the other one was, you know, what am I actually saying about the origins of Tai Chi? And the, What I did, what I what I did in my book is is I showed that um, you know in this book, uh, Tai Chi Bagua Zhang and the Golden Elixir, is I, I showed that that uh, Qi Ji Guan was actually a religious figure as well. He was very closely related to. Um, uh, he was deeply involved in religion, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, but I'm so forgetting his name right now. It's right on the tip of my tongue. Um, he's a, uh, anyway, it'll come to me in a second. He, he, he started a massive cult, the, the guy who, and, and he had a, and he used talismans and he healed um, uh, Chi Guan when he was injured. Um, and 
he taught him the golden elixir as well. And so we have that document, you know. Oh, sorry, I didn't, I, I didn't hear. So, sorry, so he, sorry, Scott, I didn't hear. No, that, that's okay. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to um, put us back on regular uh, share anyway, so we can see. Um, so this is a, um, you know, in, in, the eight, in, the, in that period there between when, um, when Chi Ji Guan was fighting pirates, he was organizing militia. Um, and he was uh, organizing the funding of militia, this particular religious leader. And he, he also met directly with John Sun Fung, uh, was his claim that he met in, that John Sun Fung taught him the golden elixir. Um, and he was, you know, he, and he had a huge cult. I mean, this, it wasn't suppressed until, until mid, uh, until the, the, the 1700s. And it was all over, you know, it was in Beijing, his temples were in Beijing. They were all, he was in Fujian, but it, they were all over the place. Um, and so, you know, Chi Ji Guan, and, and he, 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 he built statues to Chi Ji Guan. It's probably because of Chi Ji Guan's involvement in religion that we really know about him. So I feel like it's been, he's been really misrepresented in that sense that he was not only connected to Zhang Zan Fang, but he was clearly connected to a religious movement, which was very theatrical as well. We, there's lots of evidence for that. And and so, you know, when he mentions, for instance, we don't know what he meant. There's a it, like stumbling Zhang's technique he mentions as one of his things, uh, one of his influences. Uh, sway is the term, right? So it means sweeping or, or, uh, or slipping technique. So it suggests a drunken style. We don't have no way of knowing if that Zhang was Zhang Sun Feng, but it's possible. Um, and, and then the other thing I found was that in... Um, is that there was a play, which of course, most of these large plays, these hundred chapter plays were like, like, uh, like Xiangji, uh, Xioji or such were, were composites of smaller plays. They were a sem assemblage of other plays. And so this, this one play, it's called uh, Xiangji, right? It's, it's, uh, it's about uh, Sanbao, uh, the uh, Zhenghe, Right, it was his his name was his uh, canonized name was San Bao. Um, Zheng He's journey to the West in a boat is the name of this play, and it, it's mentioned by Lu Xun um, in his you know survey of literature. So it was quite well known. Um, and in the the middle chapters, right in the middle of the book, uh, is is a battle of of the story of Zhang Sunfeng, and Zhang Sunfeng. Um, goes and to the uh, to the emperor on behalf of the Buddha uh, to gather um, his uh, his his Xing the the emperor the emperor's Xing right this is uh, this is the incarnation of Zhang Wu the idea is the emperor is the incarnation of Zhang Wu and he's going to take his Xing for a, a battle it's a complicated story I could lay it out more but basically he's in beijing and he gets in a fight with the palace guards because he's drunk and asleep and he fights them and the and the and the play lists the techniques and these are the same names as chi ji guan and they have overlap with other names from chen style so it's it's certain actually that um that that, that naming um component was connected to theater. And it's also certain that it was connected to Johnson Fung. So the previous research before my, my quite simple work on this uh, is wrong. Um, the Tai Chi, whether we can link that exactly to Tai Chi is maybe an open question, but that the naming strategy and that the fighting concepts can be linked to Johnson Fung as a theatrical character and as a religious character, I think is indisputable at this point. But you know, in what you said, there are, there are many, many, many ways to, to, to locate. First, of course, the first challenge is, did Zhang San Feng exist? That's, uh, that's uh, the, 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 the no, first no, challenge. No, no, I'm not talking about his existence. I'm not talking about his existence. I'm, no, I'm, no, no, I, I understand, I understand. But, but, but you see, if it's, it's if a, a theatrical uh, figure or, or, or a religious one, 
um, then sure, no problem. We know that uh, we know that for uh, quite a few centuries, martial arts have been prohibited, especially by the the, the, the Manchus, and that it survives through through theater, through Chinese opera and local operas. So so sure, there are a certain number of techniques, a certain number of martial arts, uh, which are in depth with with uh, with uh, various operas. Uh, mm -hmm. That that's clear. And even up to now, uh, I, for about my first years in Taiwan, I have followed local operas because I'm very fond of puppets and, 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 and local operas. And I was uh, making research and, I, and I've seen this guy uh, in training and, and the, 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 the opera school was very close to where I live. So every day in the morning when I will go to practice my Tai Chi, I will see this guy uh, practicing. And there's definitely a, a connection and, and which is fascinating because everything in, in China is very organic. And that, that's really, uh, I, I fully agree with that. There, there are connections. Uh, but uh, as far as you, you're talking about Qi Ji Guang and its religious uh, belief and so on. It makes me think about my my teacher of Tai Chi Chuan was uh, that you can see Wang Yan Yan is in the book of Robert Smith. He was a uh, head of a uh, Taoist sect and he was a military and this uh, Taoist sect was very much into the military. So which which sect? Whenever you which, have which, which sect? Uh, Jin Pai. Jin Pai. Uh, uh -huh. the, Jin Pai, Jin, and uh, Jin for gold and, and Pai for, 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 for branch. And um, what I wanted to say. So th these, these worlds are very, very much connected. And, and a, a good example, and I remember my teacher at the beginning because I was coming to make research about uh, Taoism and shamanism because I was a student of uh, uh, Isabelle Robinet and also Christopher Schipper. I was fascinated by that. And at the beginning, when I was talking to him, to him, but Taoism is no use. It's no use. Practice. Uh, and when he got old in, in, in his in his eighties, uh, he started to 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 talk a lot about that. He, he got hurt in a taxi accident and so on. So um, it's something which is difficult for us to understand because we tend in the West to separate religion and your ordinary life, uh, and so. It's difficult to for us to think in terms of uh, okay religion, which in fact is not religion, is interwoven into into my daily practice or into my craft. Uh, I remember uh, Alain Touraine, who is a famous sociologist, specialist of uh, uh, sociology of the industry, when he, he came to at my invitation in in Taiwan in an enterprise. He was first surprised to see in a, in, in a small company and there, there was an altar with the gods and so on. And, but he was very smart. Uh, you know, he first asked, is it part of the company work? Is it part of the <laughs> yeah, company yeah. Uh, efficiency <laughs> work? And, and the way he has that, it, it was, he was very, very, very smart. And we immediately with my friend Fiorelli Alio, I just mentioned, we saw the, the, the head of the small company, to, the guy turned red and, and he was afraid that the Westerner will make fun of him. And, that, and he explained. And, and so I had to ask him more and more questions and he realized, wow, that's interesting because it's not just a matter of how the machine work, how much uh, uh, pieces of, of whatever you, you, you produce, the altar is also part of the part of the company uh, efficiency, no? and and <laughs> in, 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 in yeah, and 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 in martial arts, uh, I had a lot of discussion because for me, I, I'm it's very deep in in my heart. Religion and, and ordinary life should be separate. But since I've studied popular cults and religion and so on, I can't accept all those things. And and the the. The very point is that sometimes you see people, and I've seen that a lot in Taiwan, people making some rituals or small rituals or using talisman or like, for example, the Bai Shu. You, you, you know what is Bai Shu, right? Yes, yes. My, my teacher of Pagua, he, he does it in front of Tamo. But my Wang Yinen, my teacher of Tai Chi Chuan, 
we made it. I, I made the bicep in front of Sun Yat Sen. <laughs> so, <laughs> yes, totally, of course. Totally, yeah. totally different approach. And so, what is difficult is sometimes these people use their beliefs, is a popular cult of Buddhism and so on, uh, to achieve something or also to be part of a group. Uh, I've seen that in many groups where, where the main, the main uh, teacher was a believer, for example, in a certain God. So all the people believe in said God will become the, the intimate students and, and, and so on. Uh, but on the other hand, I've seen, and I think, I, I don't know if I mentioned this militia in uh, Xinluo in, in Taiwan, I interviewed the, the, the old guy. It's unfortunately at that time, I, uh, my thinking was not deep enough. But I remember asking him, but uh, what do you do right before to go fighting? You know, I, I was just into the fighting. I was not thinking intellectually. Well, he said, well, I call all the guys and, and we go in front of the temple. And I said, oh, you go in front of the temple, but do all these people believe, believe in this God? He said, it doesn't matter. In, 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 in my village, there's some guys who are Christian, some guys who are Buddhist, some guys, uh, the important thing, we, everybody goes for the fight because you're working for the community. And so the, the, the interaction is so complex. Uh, uh, now, uh, I, I begin to just to beware of first all the stories about the past because so many build up stories, especially about like uh, Zhang San Feng, for example. Um, and also the other point is probably, you know, um, Marnix Wells, his book about Zhang Nai Zhou, right? Uh, it's also very fascinating. I think uh, uh, the point which is very important is when you look at this map where you have Zhao Ba, Chen Jiago, Si Shui, so and Shaolin, uh, the influence, the mutual influence of martial arts is probably one of the main engine of, of the creation of the martial arts we know. Because, because uh, and, and, and also you have the reverse. When you look at Tai Chi, and that's, also, that's something I asked to Wang Yin Yin, uh, say, uh, uh, after pushing and asking, could we learn the fighting, the real fighting? I say, no, no, because, you know, People don't work hard enough on pushing in, so no fighting. So I asked him one day, I had to deal with a wrestler. And of course, he threw me on the ground and I, I didn't know what to do. And so I asked him one year, I said, why Tai Chi Chuan doesn't have you know, ground fighting and so on? When you do Tai Chi Chuan, you don't fall on the ground. So, <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so the reverse, the Tai Chi Chuan, I think I've been emasculated of different aspects. Uh, of his of his martial arts uh, really uh, pays, uh, but I'm ready to believe what you say because it's it's also uh, uh, I didn't hear about this guy you, you mentioned. I'll be interested to to know about that. Uh, but um, for those who, who, who listen uh, to what we're talking about, they have to keep in mind that. Like I said, the in between, there's so many stories, so many perspectives you can take and, and theater, religion, secret societies, gangsters, militia, um, army, uh, all these have deeply influenced our practice. Except that we, are, we have in our hands now a product like the one I, I, I enjoy the most, Tai Chi Chuan, is it has been transformed through different political periods and economical periods and events. And we just have a very limited understanding of what it was. But basically at the beginning, when you, especially when you look at the Chen Stai Tai Chi Chuan, you can understand that originally it was, it was really a tough fighting, but uh, for example, Shui Jiao is clearly an influence. Nobody talks about the influence of Shui Jiao, the, the, the Chinese wrestling. When you see them doing that, it's very clear. Indeed, yeah. So I, so I, I, did, I did an interview with a bunch of um, Mongolian wrestlers and dancers because I was interested in the relationship with, um, of the Mongolian dances to the Mongolian wrestling. And 
uh, unfortunately the yeah yeah you've seen some of it yeah and 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 of course that it 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 being in beijing and in tianjin that there was there must be some influence i, I also since i study liu he xin yi i i've been interested in the in the the sort of garrison cities and and the way in which um Hui communities and muslim communities uh were uh were training um, so I, I kind of tried to look at this aspect of it too, and it's really quite unfinished. And the interview was was really terrible. It was about eighty percent in Mongolian and and twenty percent translation. I, I didn't publish it, but um, it was it really they really do get a sense of the those the 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 relationship to animals, um, wrestling itself and dance were really merged in that world in there and there still are um and so you know that that Absol absolutely had a huge influence Sorry, go ahead yeah. no i mean I, I by the way i finally found it, um, lin jiao an lin jiao an was it was the uh the the uh the teacher or the the friend and teacher of chi Guang. okay i i don't know about him I you know, you know um, Dean, the, uh, what's his first name? The book is called uh, The Lord of the Three and One in English. Um, his name is, uh, he's, he's, at, uh, he's in, a Canadian. He's at, um, anyway, he's, he, early, he studied, he's written about Taoism quite a bit um, early on. Gosh, what's his name? Hang on. I will get his name quickly. have that too. Uh, Kenneth Dean. Kenneth Dean, uh, his book is Lord of Three and One, and it, uh, it, it's all D -E -N, about D-E-N, D-E-A-N, yeah, yeah, Kenneth Dean, and, and it's, it's um, you know, he's an expert in Taoism, but he wrote an entire book on, on Lin Jiao An because it's a, he's a special case, right, he's a combination of Buddhism and Taoism and, and Confucianism, and, and it was quite a large cult until it was suppressed, Um and and there is there he even speculates others have speculated that the play uh, the the play the journey to the west in a boat or about uh, Zheng He was actually meant to be about Lin Jiao An um, that it was a critique mm. of both Lin Jiao An mm. and Xi Ji Guan and I don't think anybody's really deeply explored that but um, and my skills aren't good enough but it. Um, my literary skills are not even remotely good enough to do that, but it, it seems like that is an important thing because that play would have been everywhere. Um, and, and I, in general, I don't think people, and, and maybe I'm wrong, maybe this work has been done somewhere. I'm not aware of it, but looking at, at uh, Johnson Fung as a theatrical character and, you know, his spread as a, not just as a, as a, as a, uh, a spirit writing cult, which some of that work has been done, but um, but as a theatrical character, because as you, you said, brilliant. I really loved your explanation. You know, these things are merged. Um, the other mm. thing, the other thing I wanted to say is that you know, in the in this book, uh, I, uh, let, 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 yeah, go ahead. I'll come back to that. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, yeah. I just wanted to. Because you said something very important and that very often uh, people ignore that. And I was in communication with a young researcher, brilliant one, was part of the conference, you know, you mentioned in your email in, in Toulouse and in Paris in Quai Branly about uh, ma uh, martiality and, and religion. Uh, something which, uh, remember, at the beginning, I came to Taiwan to study shamanism. Uh, and I had the opportunity to 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 meet some people who are experts into into that among uh, among them Fiore Aliu. Uh, and in shamanism, there's something which is uh, very interesting for us uh, into martial art is you have two kind of of shamanism, but uh, it it will be too long to explain here. No, no, just uh, briefly least, uh, briefly state what the two uh, types are. Well, the, the 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 I was mentioning there is and uh, there is a guy. If you have the opportunity to read his book, it's it's really fabulous. Uh, we have a, a top specialist, Robert Amayon, uh, who wrote a huge book about shamanism. Shamanism, but recent. Uh, Charles Stepanov, who is probably of Russian origin, has written a fascinating book 
challenging all the the, the understanding of, of, of shamanism. And he talked about an open tent shamanism and a closed tent shamanism. The open tent is a, it's, it's the one we know through documentaries and so on, which is perform, perform outside. And the closed tent is more limited. It's more in the northern part of Siberia and Arctic and uh, Eskimos and Inuit and so on, uh, which is practiced inside the tent. And very often these guys, they don't, um, or you say that, they don't, mm, oh, there is a word, cir cir circum circumambulation. I don't know if you have this word in, in English. Yes, you, you know, yes, you, you, you're yes, turning, yes. you're turning in circle. Yes. yes and yes. these guys are the opposite. They, they lie on the ground. They lie, they lie on the ground. But in a way, it's, it's, it's more common than that. And the open tent is, uh, we know very well that very often the shaman use animal spirit to, to for di very different operation. But at least there's one which is of interest for us, is that uh, when he has to fight against another shaman, and especially when the tribe goes to war, uh, very often, the guy perform the, the movement of the animals who, who protects him. So if you put yourself, and that's only a theory I have, uh, I, and especially when I, when I read about the myth of Zhang Sun Fong and Zhen Wu, that really popped up in my mind. Uh, if you put yourself into the head of a guy going to war, and among my students I have some militaries uh, war in the special forces and so on, and they all say the same thing. You can be the top gun before to go to war, you're afraid. When, when the fire starts, you're afraid. You, the, the thing is, you have to control your fear, right? So it's, for me, it's very easy to think that this guy, in all the times where everything was magical, religious, whatever you call, if you see a, the powerful man of your tribe using animals' movement, to fight. So for you, the animal somewhere is a guide to fight in an efficient manner. And that's probably one of the reasons why you have so many martial arts, Chinese martial arts, uh, uh, like uh, tiger martial arts, uh, white crane, and, 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 and all this. And the fighting of, of the myths of fighting for Tai Chi Chuan between a snake and a bird, which doesn't make any sense because a bird will kill a snake, but not a snake will kill a bird. But when you think about the symbolism of the bird and the symbolism of the snake, then you understand. This is a shaman. This is the, this is an exorcism, right? It's it's a symbol of. And it's, it's it's for me. Well, no, for me, basically, it's it's uh, when you look at the history of Wudong. But again, it's a, a personal view. I, I don't pretend to to stay to say the truth. Um, when you look at Taoism. The, I'm, I'm talking about the religious Taoism. What did Taoism do, especially when Buddhism uh, started to invade uh, uh, China? They aggregated different cults from the popular cults to the point that now uh, a lot of, when you ask to any Taiwanese, they say, oh, yeah, I'm a Taoist. But in fact, they are into popular cults. And these popular cults are a mix of shamanism, animism, whatever, whatever you want. And, and the, the, the snake and uh, the, the, the bird, the bird is a symbol of, uh, of, uh, of shamanism. And the snake is a symbol of Taoism. Taoism has killed, has overpowered shamanism. So in, in a period where when symbolic language was so important, it's a way symbolically to, to, you know, to show the ordinary people, here we are, we have the power, the Taoist has the power. Because most of the time, Taoist people, the Taoist priests were much more, um, uh, how do you say that, uh, educated in a way. Mm. And they, they knew how to write and so on. When people in popular cults, and even nowadays, you can see that the, the, the hierarchy between the Tao Shi, the priest, and the shaman, we call that Tonki here in, in, in Taiwan. There's definitely a hierarchy. I mean, for the Taoist priests, these people are just, you know, uh, <laughs> incurred people. Uh, and, and so for me, it's, it's one way to interpret. And you might 
be right, it might also be a, an, an uh, exorcism because of Zhen Wu and, and, and that's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very complex. But what you pointed at uh, about animals is really a field to explore uh, because, again, it, as far as I know, maybe Africa, they, they have that, but I don't know about African martial arts, but uh, it's quite unique to have so many martial arts linked to animals. Uh, I mean, uh, yeah, ahead. yeah, yeah. So, um, <laughs> the I, you know, I don't remember where I read this, and so I, I can't tell you the reference, but I, I was reading, I'm trying, I might remember if I think about it, but the, the, uh, the, it was just a claim about the way, uh, about the way in which a temple, if you really hang out at certain types of temples. And I believe they were talking about Beijing, old temples in Beijing and looking at documents for particular temples. That a temple might be to a particular god, say Guan Yu, right? Um, but that if you really ask the locals and hang out with them, it actually might be a fox spirit or it might be some other animal. And that they just adopted the official government deity um, as a kind of cover for the actual cult that was going on underneath. Um, so I, I think that, that once you realize that, then you can see that oftentimes the, the, um, the human personifications in martial arts are actually covers for animal ones. Um, the, uh, you know, what, what you're talking about Beijing is, is very well known uh, in, in, in Taiwan and I, Personally, I had this experience a few times because uh, I took part to exorcism and, and all this kind of, uh, of stuff when I, was, uh, when I was young. You never have to forget uh, religion, whatever you call religion uh, as, as, a, as a big word, uh, but it's also big business. You've been to Taiwan. You've seen, you've seen you know, these, these, these temples, very rich temples, Again, controlled by, by, by the gangsters. But uh, the very basic reason, it's big business. You have to attract people, right? So like you said, if, you, if this temple has been erected because, in fact, there is a, a, a fox, demons, and whatever, not all people might come. But if you put Guan Yu, who is, who is you know, the god <laughs> of business people and so on, yes. then uh, <laughs> it works better, <laughs> right? Marketing. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. Um, so w something we, 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 uh, we've danced around a bunch, um, and, and so I just wanted to say it. In, in, my, in my book, right, I, I actually went over the whole cosmology of, of snakes and birds because, and because I, I linked that to, um, to Naja. Or Nija, um, and and that he actually represents he's the snake killer or the dragon killer, right? That's part of his prowess as well. And so part of the Taoist adoption of him is as in that role and playing the role of the the, the marshal of the central altar. He is the um, he's the commander of troops and a killer of snakes, right? So the the image of you know this. This maybe shaman baby who has now been enlisted on behalf of Taoism is very clear in the in the cosmology there. Um, and the the other piece of that, that because we talked about this the business end, the um, these uh, what do you call them the um, uh, caravan guards in Beijing. Um, uh, so, sorry, I didn't. I didn't hear the what? The caravan guards, the guard, oh, the people, oh, okay. right? Yeah. Yeah. They um, had altars to uh, Nija. They were the, they they were actual. You know, you could say worshippers. Well, we didn't have to worship. They had altars to Nija, and they the Nija cult was actually a, a, you know what what all caravan guards had in common. Was this connection to to the Nija cult, and that's that's why I made the case, the part of my case, that Bagua Zhang is in fact a depiction of Nija, and he's riding wind fire wheels. That's why the stepping is that way, and he's fighting dragons and snakes. That's his story, right? This and that 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 whole mime is in fact 
um, connects him. And I don't know if you've seen the, the work of um, uh, Israeli guy. Um, oh, Shah? Shahar, Shahar, Shahar. Mm-hmm. Um, that uh, in, he, he connects him to, to Krishna. And in my, you know, tw- uh, 20 years ago, 30 years ago now, I was doing Indian classical dance. So I had a tremendous amount and that, they, which is all, it's another name for the style of dance I did is the dance of Krishna, Natawari Nritya, mm-hmm. which means dance of Lord Krishna. And there's so, it was all apparent to me because I was studying Bhagwa at the same time that the, the iconography was very close, but I could but it wasn't until I read his book that I thought, oh, of course it's close because they, they, the, the Indians were in China during the Ming dynasty. They were there. They were dancing. Of course, Dan, they sent dancers. Who else would they send? <laughs> mm. You know, but, but dan- dancing, you know, it's, it's also very interesting because dancing also connected to war. Uh, you have a lot of dance for, for, for war, right? These specific da- Indian dances were connected to war. That hasn't been written about yet, but I've, there's a woman here who did her dissertation on it. I'm trying to get that published. Uh, um, and and yeah. in Pagua Zhong, you have the snake style of Pagua Zhong. It's just snake and dragon, right? I mean, <laughs> not uh, the dragon. Yeah, yeah. I just know the, the snake one uh, because for me, Pagua Zhong is a, just my second mouse uh, art. I, I was practicing it mostly for to improve my Tai Chi. But but uh, yes, yes, and, and that's it, it's also uh, uh, sometime uh, I remember when I. Uh, one of my very first girlfriend was a Serbian, and I remember attending a, a, a dance in uh, in Bosnia Herzegovina, uh, where you know the Muslim and the Serbian uh, all at that time it was not war; it was in the sixties. Ah. And uh, I remember it really struck me. Uh, there was a dance, which was a military dance, uh, and this military dance was normally usually accompanied by singing you know for fighting and as very specific movement and it was in fact a mute dance and they had just uh, small bells on uh, attached to the ankles uh-huh. <laughs> and the way they were they were hitting the ground was uh, like a discourse but at that time because they were under turkish dominance they couldn't say they couldn't explain uh, okay, uh, uh, we speak too loud because my wife is sleeping, <laughs> but I'm gonna try to go there. Uh, and 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 of course, uh, dance uh, in many places was, was probably a way uh, to address war or to get a training. Your dancer, you probably know that. And by the way, if you interested, uh, one very good colleague of mine, uh, who's a researcher, I spent many years in Shanghai. Is the one who, who helped me to publish uh, an article about uh, the the spiritual values into pushing in an article I wrote in French and English. Is a dancer. Is a is a is a dancer and a martial artist. You might be interested to to meet him. What's his name? And f- what's his name? His name is Marceau Chenou. Chenou. C H E N A U L T. And he's very much into Qigong, Tai Chi Chuan. He has a background of professional dancer uh, and um, a fascinating guy. You, you will be interested. If you're interested, I'll send you his, his connection. Oh, yeah, it sounds and, good. Um, and for, information, for your information as a dancer, you should be interested that you know Maurice Béjar. No. Béjar, a very famous choreographer of modern dance. Uh, in the 50s and, uh, and 60s is one of, one of the biggest name in the world of uh, modern dance. In, in, in France? Uh, he was, I think he's a Belgian originally, and, and, and his, uh, his dance troupe was in uh, Switzerland. You, sh- you, sh- you probably I, saw his name. Considering how much uh, I really do know the history of modern dance, I'm surprised I'm not, I don't know that name. I, uh, yeah, I probably have. There must be oh, some connection. Huge, oh, yes, he's a huge name. And he, he, he asked his dancers to train into Tai Chi Chan to improve uh, that dance. Uh, just, a, just an anecdote for you to probably. Yeah, you know, 
Um, just to, to, to late. So I did Indian classical dance, which is, is um, called Kathak, which you wear bells on your ankles, a lot of like five pounds of bells. I mean, it's military training, right? It's like, it has that quality and they're, 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 they're faceted bells. So they will cut your leg um, uh, uh -huh. or, they, or they will stop a sword. I mean, they're mm. right. I mean, it's not, we're not joking. If you can kick with those bells on, you have a lot of power, um, but it's a stamping it's a stamping art, right? Like flamenco. And so you absolutely are, are you know, uh, and, and, it, and it's, it's framed, at least one version of it is framed as a duel. So you can be dueling with another dancer or you can be dueling with the drummer. Um, mm -hmm. And this would, probably was to inspire people, um, again, it's like the Chinese tradition, before or after battle, you know, mm -hmm. that there was some you know, a celebration, maybe a victory, but also to inspire the troops. And supposedly the dancers would lead into battle. The dancers and the drummers would, would lead the battle formations in, in India in the, in the 1600s. Um, so that's just fascinating, right? Like, but, but uh, that, so, the, but the other thing I was going to say, just because it's, it's, it was on my mind recently, um, in, in, there's a there's a video that someone sent me, which is I guess it's copyrighted. We haven't it hasn't spread very much, but it, it's a long, maybe three hour video of um, a guy in prison um, being in Italian prison, being interviewed. He's gay. He's very clearly gay guy. He's being interviewed about um, about dance and its relationship to um, uh, stiletto fighting, um, knife fighting. And. And because he'd been in prisons all over, he's someone who had spent his life in prison. He'd been in prisons all over Italy and learned the local dances, dances from, from many, many different folk dances all over Italy. And he was, he's showing in the video how all of them are actually knife fighting skills. Um, so I think this is- this Why subject. not? The, the, capo, the capoeira. Of course, yeah. And, and so this- you know, this is, I, for me, this is a really important framing of the subject, because I think when we look at the Chinese subject, we've tended to accept this idea of a separate martial art. But I, I, I actually think the, 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 the world picture is, is, a, is a better framing. And it's a difficult one, because we, every culture is so different. Um, but yeah. Well, de definitely. I mean, I, I've in that respect, I, I fully agree with uh, what you say. I mean, for me, it's uh, right at the beginning when I, when I was involved into martial art, it, it was clear. I remember uh, one of the very old students of, uh, of my Tai Chi Chuan uh, teacher uh, tell me, oh, you have to practice Tai Chi like you watching a Chinese opera. <laughs> and it, at that time, it didn't mean anything for me because I was coming from soccer and I didn't have any understanding of what I was doing. Uh, but later on, uh, I understood because uh, I started to study with a, a famous uh, teacher of a Chinese opera in France, in Paris, who is very knowledgeable about that. And, and, and I started to understand a, a lot of things. And like, like, like I said, I mean, everything is connected in China. And that, that, that's a big challenge. The, the only thing for me, which is, um, uh, how to say that? Yeah, I can say I'm fighting against that or, or I'm trying to, to um, set up a, a balance in the discourse. Is that when you read most of the books and most of the discourse of either Chinese or many Westerners about Tai Chi Chuan, uh, it, it's only now a, a practice of well being, of good health, and, and, and it's all stories of uh, supernatural power with a chi and, and blah, blah, blah. And that for me, it's, it's just uh, something I, I'm fully against because, uh, first of all, it's manipulating people. I, I don't like that. And it's also a discourse uh, where people are always think we are superior to external martial art, which is a nonsense, especially for me, external and internal doesn't mean much, uh, at least not such a frontier as it is explained. Um, I've seen people in external martial arts uh, doing so beautifully that for me it was internal and, I, and I've I had some pushing which were <laughs> very violent, very, very external. So uh, 
sure you 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 have to 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 show the people that uh, we're dealing with something which is strongly connected to many other fields where in the west we have tended to cut every discipline from this from its concept and basically uh, i'm not a, a religious guy but basically because uh, we remove uh, the supernatural from our lives uh, science became a, a very powerful way of thinking and i'm very much uh, into it but uh, we we cut the roots of an organic vision of what we are doing in, in all the time. Because when you look at uh, fencing and wrestling, the, the, those guys fencing in the Middle Age and in the Renaissance, they were also practicing wrestling. Now you do wrestling only or you do fencing only, right? Because of competition, because of whatever, whatever. Well, they were also it. practicing, you know, the... Um, uh, uh, prayers the hours you know they were they were they were singing you know about their absolute devotion to the virgin i mean that yeah. <laughs> this is totally. not you can't you can't separate there was there was taking a lot of their time it's you know like we watch tv no they were praying nah. you know? <laughs> um the the uh well i i I feel like we are so close and I feel like this has been an incredible, you know, meeting of brothers or maybe you're a senior to me. So I should oh, call you something else, but, but it, it's it, that it's been incredible. Uh, but I do disagree with you. And I think, I think I can push you to my opinion, but it might, we might have to meet in person for you to truly be convinced of my position on, but I believe that the definition of internal martial arts is simply the combination of martial skills with the golden elixir and that is it's not used i understand i, I didn't not always I, I didn't hear yeah. scott, 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 i'll scott, say it scott. again i didn't hear you said combination of martial arts and what and jindan the golden elixir it jindan uh, uh, okay, the golden okay. elixir and and i okay. understand that in modern the, the in the the last hundred years, it hasn't always been used that way. But I believe if you go, it's one of the arguments I make in my book, if you go before the Boxer Uprising, that internal martial arts is, is not a new concept. It's an old concept. And it, it, uh, it means the combination of the golden elixir with martial skills. And you can see this across secret societies. Uh, I'll say it again. Um, the golden elixir, uh, and martial skills were, were before the boxer uprising was the definition of internal martial arts. And that you can see that if you look at secret societies, if you look at Baojuan, for instance, you'll see this kind of thing. And it's evident in, in theater. Whenever in, th in the theater, whenever you, you have a character who needs to develop skills quickly, they give him a pill. They give him the elixir to eat, you know, or, or they remake his body in the chase of, of, of Nuja. They remake his body with the golden elixir that, uh, that uh, it, throughout the, the, all of the major epics have this, cosmo this, this phenomenon where you have a, someone who's a, a demonic fighting character and they add the golden elixir to the person. And they become the, an even better fighter. And that, that is my understanding of where that comes from and why mm -hmm. you have all that. I, you address the manipulation issue. And, this, and, and I think that this is really important that we try to, to because we, are, we come from our own morality. And you, in the, as I think you, you said, you know, um, Taiji maybe is amoral. Uh, right. You no, know, I, I don't think I don't think a system could be moral or immoral. The people who practice the system. Ah, I said amoral, which means what you just said. Amoral ah, versus okay. immoral. Yeah. Amoral. Ah, okay. 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 Yeah. Okay. Um. And and so it, it's it, it's this um, but 
I, my sense of it, and this is, again, this is one of those things that, that you might be better uh, situated to, to think about or, or research even, is that, uh, the, that actors and martial artists were low, low caste. They were low, low status. And so at some point they became, and quite early, they became teachers of the high, of high status people, right? There was this inversion. So, uh, for instance, a wealthy uh, family might hire um, actors to live in the house and teach the children. And so they had this, and they didn't even have first, you know, last names. They were, they were very degraded socially. And so that's, that is a, a setup for manipulation, right? Like if you, you don't respect me, so I am going to teach you wrong. <laughs> right. I'm going to teach you this little piece and then that little piece. And, you know, maybe I show you, but I will tell you the wrong. I'll show it to you correctly, but I'll tell you the wrong thing. You know, I think that that's deeply embedded in the arts because because of that social structure. Um, the other thing, uh, one thing, one yeah, thing, ahead. which is. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Go ahead. No, you keep going. I, I it's, go a ahead, good, go ahead. it's a good break. Okay, so I, I was just going to okay. say that. I use the term magic and tricks a lot because um, I, I have, you know, I also practice the external martial arts and I, and many different martial arts actually. And I, I love all of that stuff, but for me, the internal martial arts, especially as I get older are about doing magic tricks, like creating illusions, some of which you can fight with, some of which not so good for writing, but they're cool to watch. You know, they're cool illusions or, or even more to feel. You, you feel them and you go, wow, how did that happen? Um, and so this, I, I, to me, this is part of, I'll just throw this out because it's big. This is part of connecting to the idea of healing, right? It's not, it's not what people think it is exactly. It's actually the golden elixir, which is not, it's not a normal sense of healing. It's, it's, it's the resolution of opposites. It's, um, it's the, it's, a, it's a, a different way of perceiving reality. It's, um, or, you know, it's, it's a, it's not your normal sense of healing. So people get very confused when they, when they try to lay that on top of it. Um, but the other thing is, um, uh, not just magic, but, um, Oh, I forgot. <laughs> it's too many things, too many ideas. Too excited. I get too excited. <laughs> <laughs> fung song, fung song. Uh, but, you know, to, to, to get back to the point that you mentioned, uh, for me, the, 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 the change in Tai Chuan is not, is, is not uh, the boxer rebellion is just a tip point for a tipping point for all the martial arts, and you, you can see that in the writings of the of the Chinese teachers, especially of the those who were writing about Tai Chi and Paul Brennan translation has made a fabulous work for that. Uh, it was already in a in a nineteenth century. The, the scholars were changing were were changing the game, uh, but uh, also when you say teaching the teaching mistakes. It's not only teaching mistakes, or uh, it's very often within the martial arts school uh, because of the very patriarchal uh, structure of Chinese society. Uh, the teachers wouldn't teach uh, his all art to 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 his best students. He will wait until uh, until he dies, but. Unfortunately, he couldn't. He couldn't program his his, his death. And um, the famous um, specialist, uh, the English guy, uh, an old guy who, who has passed away, who wrote Science and Civilization in China, Needham. Needham, yeah. Needham just mentioned that in a, in, vo uh, in volume five five, when he said about uh, Chinese alchemy uh, and 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 all this kind of stuff. He said you have a. a thousand layers of knowledge which in fact basically are the same it's just because uh they they the the, the teacher coded his practice he passed away before to transmit everything and his students 
code it again the code and 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 that's where we are now and and this is very very common i've met many many teachers in taiwan even nowadays uh, who are just teaching part of their knowledge because for them it's a matter of keeping the power it's very important in the face of a teacher uh in terms of money it's also very very important but also uh, in terms of you know i i have to exist until i die you know when you're getting very old i don't know how old you are but i'm i'm 69 and i can feel when getting older you, you feel the urgency to transmit but in same time you still want to be part of this world moving right you don't want just to be just a leftover and and in in chinese society it's extremely important when you are the head of family the head of a clan or a teacher with which is such a, a prestigious job mm. uh, you you should be always at the top you should be always in control on on, on, on everything and i can see that because uh, being a being a scholar uh, whenever people know that i'm a teacher in university Oof, I'm just, you know, I'm just gone, God on earth. Uh, oh, I can yeah. tell them I'm just an ordinary teacher, but for them. And so the, when you see the system of martial arts, in fact, it's based, structurally speaking, all the rituals, all the, the, the system that it works, it's in parallel with the, with the school system, except those who were in the school system it's a long tradition in China. They are considered very, very, very high, even nowadays. When those into martial arts, and you mentioned that uh, and you, 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 you're right, martial arts, uh, jugglers, uh, actors, and so on, they just the leftovers of, of society. And so, so for me, this, this, this notion of to get back to the internal, external, it's not a problem for me to, to say, if people tell me, oh, I'm doing an internal martial art for whatever reason, it's okay. You believe that, like you believe it's golden legacy, other one thinks it's because of the breathing or whatever. It's okay for me, that's, that's not a problem. The problem is when people start to say, oh, because I do, a, 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 a practice internal martial art, I am superior to, those guys who yes. are just using brute force, who are just stupid guys who don't understand the, you know, the the, the very deep philosophy of uh, what they're doing. This I cannot stand it, because. But, but I think that they, this happened. I, I understand, but but I think that this happened because because this is why I trace it to the to the boxer uprising. It's just, and of course you're right. This is just a stand-in for a, a transition that happened over 20 years, um, but it is that the reason we're we're hearing it that way is because of the loss of the religious connection in other words if this was a fashi right you know in other words the the martial arts teacher i think was closer to the fashi and so the fashi is getting his lineage from divine connection and so when they say i'm superior they're actually not saying I'm superior. They're saying my jiao, my teaching is superior because, but when you cut off the connection to the deity, then it becomes me and then it becomes arrogant and then it becomes, you know, uh, uh, annoying. <laughs> but, uh, no. but do you see what I'm saying? That I think that, that no. that's what we're seeing. And, and that, you know, if you said to me, my lineage is superior, I'd say, well, have you fought this other, you know, can your deity beat my deity? You know, like, you know, if it's, it's happening in, in some other spatial cosmos, it would be a very different thing. So, thank you. <laughs> um, it, the, if you, it's okay, it'll, it'll come in a second. If, if the cosmology, right, is that I am, a, I am not just a martial arts teacher, but I am a fa shi, I am a, I am a um, not just, you know, I am, I am a religious ritual expert in fighting demons, right? I'm fighting spiritual forces that when, when I say I'm superior, that's what it means. And, and so 
it has if you if you are another some practitioner of a different art you you would also say well my art comes from this you know god from this spiritual tradition you know and 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 there's a hierarchy there right an implicit hierarchy of the deities and also an implicit conversation about the way in which they upset each other or battle right it, it, so the you know the battle between uh, Nuja and sun wukong for instance right is is like you know I do monkey style. No, I do Bagua Zhang, you know, like, ah, <laughs> like our deities are fighting, right? It's different than me versus you. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I could agree. I could agree with this, uh, this explanation that, that makes sense. Uh, but see, I think it's very important for us people who are deeply involved into into uh, this practice to and that's what you're doing by interviewing uh, Mark Mellenbird or, or discussing with me or with others is, is to help all these people who are practicing with 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 their ingenuity with their face into the teachers uh, face into uh, all the people who are teachers and who, who should be teaching correctly that uh, China is Chinese martial art is a fascinating world. Uh, there are many stories. You can take stories from many different angles, but we have in common, whoever we are, Chinese, Taiwanese, French, American, or whatever, there are, there are basic, very basic attitudes because martial arts are always talking about morality. You should develop a high morality by practicing martial arts. And whatever explanation you have, and not everybody can have access to, right? You, 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 you're a highly educated person, very knowledgeable, uh, but the average practitioner, they don't know so much about, about this culture. So the result they're having uh, whatever is the explanation you're mentioning, uh, and, and with which I can agree, but in the end, the end product is this lack of a respect for other people practicing mm -hmm. other martial arts or practicing qigong or practicing whatever, yes. whatever practice. And for me, it's it's uh, it's important, maybe because I'm getting older, that my knowledge go into. Uh, Helping these people to understand, forget about it. I have some people in my in among my students who are military, was uh, who have an ordinary job, and of course, the discussion we have tonight, they they wouldn't understand because they don't have our, our knowledge about, about Chinese culture. But in the end, they might have, and some have better skill than I have in fighting. Or, or, and hopefully some of my students will become better than me in pushing in and whatever. And I think it's very important not to, to uh, in West, because we Westerners, to blur the transmission of this martial art from Chinese to the West by so many stories which don't belong to the Western discourse. That doesn't mean that the Western discourse should dominate the Chinese one. But at least when this, and that's part of my professional uh, uh, life, I think it's very important to, I wouldn't say clean, because maybe it, it will be a disres dis disrespectful uh, word, but to the aspect of Chinese cultures, we tend to make people believe that if you don't believe in this, if you don't believe in skill is inside you. It's just no matter you, you yeah, the skill is inside you. The skill is not is not in any gods or, or any any uh, supreme lineage or whatever. Uh, and I, I, personally, I find many people are confused because there are so many thousand stories about what we're doing that they, these stories are, are on front stage and the real skill is only backstage. And the, 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 the real skill is very simple. You've been to martial arts, you're in dancing, you know what is moving a body, right? 
and you know what is connecting a body with spirit with, with your mind that's a very very basic but I, then, I, I think there's i think there's a like this conflict here right when we're talking about the the, the asia particularly china uh, um and and europe versus europe and the united states is that it's right where we started talking about this this black and black versus white right the the and you there's a this this merged in the middle thing right that in since saint augustine we have this idea of the body as separate from spirit and you have this concept of pure spirit in the west and and just and de, and the the the, the profane uh, i disagree body. with that yeah you have I, I, I disagree i oh go ahead i disagree with that scott well, why why what what's your I, I hope our connection isn't we're losing our connection again <laughs> oh no <laughs> there you're back what, uh, uh, sorry to interrupt you but uh, 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 do you know slinger hand Sli no slinger land what the, Wait a minute. the writing Wait a minute. style the, for teaching language Slingerland? Yes. Yes. He, he, he wrote uh, I have it here. I just Yeah, Slingerland. It it's a type of it's a type of language learning. Yeah. Oh, this. Can you can you see? Can you see his book? I haven't seen that one, no. I have not. Okay, it's a fabulous book. It's called Mind and Body in Early China. It's uh, Oxford Press. I'll get it. It looks good. It sounds important. It's a great. It's a great book, and he he he, he just shows. Um, I've been in contact with this guy. A very smart guy. Uh, it just shows that at the opposite of what we think, body and mind have not always been one in Chinese culture. And on the opposite, I will say, if we put apart uh, Descartes and Men du Biron in, in the West, where they clearly cut off the, the, you know, the link between uh, body and mind, but since the, I would say, 18th century in, in, in Europe, there, there, there is a renewed interest, and especially in the end of the 19th century and the 20th century, now it's big, that, that the body and mind are, are connected. Do you hear? Yes, no? yes, yes, yes. Do you hear I, me? Yes, I do. I can hear you. And, okay, this is fascinating and, and clearly worth exploring further. But my point is slightly different. The, the point I was making is that in if we're talking about what the, the way in which we understand spirit, shun, in for instance, shun would be one term or ling in, in Chinese culture, um, it's not separate from here. In other words, it's happening right here. So if I you do taiji and I use shun or ling, you know, to to uh man, to manipulate the another person's jin or jing, right? If I, they, they, I make them jing and I manipulate it with my shun or ling. This, oh yes, it's just in me. Yes, it's just something physical. Yes, it's something in the, our Western view or our modern view, you could say, it's just me with my skills, sure. But the reason the language is of for ling and shun is because those, so that wasn't a separate realm. That's my argument. It wasn't a separate realm. We are, we were the ideas that Taiji took place in a in a religious realm, even even as it was a pure set of skills. Well, when uh, you have you have to be very very careful with with the notion of Shen and Ling, uh, because. Uh, you have many, many instances, and especially in martial arts, but but in in uh, in also in religion, uh, where it's completely separated, and for different reasons. 
because because you have to manipulate the different levels, right? Uh, so so it, it just um, to come back to 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 I don't know if it's it's really uh, meaningful for for the average people, but. In, in, in Chinese, uh, whenever you're interacting, uh, for example, I can see that in, in, in pushing and I still uh, take part to uh, groups practicing free pushing ends every, every Sunday. Um, it's clear when you practice with them, the, they don't care about Shen. They, they don't think about Shen and Ling and, 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 and whatever. Uh, it's just winning when they push. Uh, because face, of course, uh, because just human beings, we all with the ego, and I'll, I'm also trying to win. Uh, and and the relationship that what's happening when you when when you're fighting at a pushing in level, which is very very gentle, uh, you just don't care about this notion of Shen and Ling and, 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 and whatever, uh, or Jing or, 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 or the Qi and, and, and so on. And I have conducted a, a research to, to prepare my books. Um, you know very well, as well as me, that in Tai Chi we say uh, the, 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 the center of energy is uh, Xia Dan Tian, right? the inferior, inferior uh, Sinebur uh, field. And I'd ask the, all the, the teachers, because we are a group of teachers uh, practicing pushing and free pushing ends uh, every sun, uh, Sunday morning. And I said, uh, where is your dantian when you're pushing? Yeah, 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 yeah. And nobody, is able to, 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 nobody is able to say anything. They just show the belly or they <laughs> say it's a yao. It, it, they it's say what? West. The, the yao, the waist, yao, uh -huh, the yao, waist, yeah, yeah, the yeah, waist. Yeah, yeah. Um, and they're very confused. And, and it, it's, not, it's not new to me. I, I, I knew about it, but I wanted it to be more formal in my, in my writings and not just to put forward my only way of thinking. Uh, and these, uh, for me, all this discourse about the Shen, the Jing, and everything coming from the Nei Tan, right? The, the inner alchemy. Uh, we have specialists like that. Probably you, you heard about Catherine Despeux. Of course, yeah. Right. Uh, very smart, very, 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 very good. But very beautiful, she, too. Uh, well, it's, it's, uh, <laughs> I, have, it's, uh, I have another style. <laughs> uh, but yeah, when, when she was young, yeah, she was, she was quite, quite good looking. Uh, now she has charm now. Charm, uh, yes, she is charming. Okay. <laughs> Uh, but it's very for me. It's a very interesting case because she's the first one to have written a PhD on Tai Chi Chuan in, in France, which was very influential, and I quote her very often. But when you read very precisely her PhD, you just find some some uh, uh, thing like uh, oh, Tai Chi Chuan is like shamanism, uh, uh, and uh, if people is pushing you here. Uh, the, you can absorb with your jing and transform it into jin and, 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 and into yuan qi and, and then suddenly uh, she states, oh, um, people believe that, you know, some people can have a kind of aura around them and you cannot get into, you cannot touch these this people because they have kind of qi around them and you cannot get into it. When you start to, 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 to talk about that, and because she never practiced pushing hands, she never practiced fighting. She, she, she was on the field in Taiwan, and I know her teacher, and I know the group. And these people, they always say the same thing. I can do this, I can do that, blah, 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 blah. Uh, but in fact, these are just words which are kind of a uh, way to say, hmm, I'm smart, I understand a lot of things, I'm connected to my culture, and this is good. I mean, I, mean, I, I don't want that to disappear. But in, in the practice, can you tell me how to use uh, 
Yuan Qi, the original Qi, or the aggressive Qi, or, or the pacific Qi, or, or whatever whatever uh, words you yes. use. Yes, I, I can. How about your Jing? How about your <laughs> how about your Shen? And and you know when you 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 have to put your feet on the ground, you have you know that very well. You have to be balanced. And when someone is is pushing you or uh, hitting you. You have to develop a very clear understanding what's going on into into to both people. There are emotional level. There are all kind of things. And so for me, these words are just words to try to explain a certain number of uh, aspect of this relationship. But the, the way it is presented, it's like it's a reality. It's like a reality. You know, I never seen. And I'd never experienced in my life. Maybe I still have to meet someone good enough. All these people trying to make me believe that they can push me at distance or, or I cannot push them. It always failed. And I'm going to tell you a story. Uh, <laughs> my first encounter with Qigong, one of my fellow guys, and I was very new to Tai Chi. He told me, well, I know a master who, who can walk. On the tofu, you know what is tofu? Yes, uh, the, yes, tofu, uh, yeah, tofu, yeah. All right, without crushing it. I said, wow. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, can we go and see that? He said, he's a Qigong master. I'm going to try it right time, now. I, sorry. <laughs> I need to try it. Take, 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 take a, a tofu made with cement. <laughs> <laughs> And of course, I paid it, did it three times. The first time, he was not feeling well. The second time, the the, the tofu was not well prepared. And the third time, he was abroad when I when I took. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and 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 it's when 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 you hear about that, say, well, that's great, great stories. Now I have great stories to tell everybody. I have another one, a guy. You know, it was uh, the time of the Bruce Lee movies. And every time you had a Kung Fu movies in Taiwan, they will have a ceremony. And that time my teacher took me and it was the guy with the face were, were, was golden and they were playing the Shaolin monks and they were making demonstration. And they, there was a ring in the middle. And then suddenly I said to everybody, oh. Oh, we lost you again. Uh, is, he, he, he's gonna uh, roll his. Wait, wait. You don't hear it. Yeah. It's it. So there was you. You the, the film. There was a Bruce Lee film. That's where it lost. And then there there was a ritual, with a gold face. That's the last. Right. Ever. So so anyway, to to make to make it short, they they set up a ring like a boxing ring, and there was a a, a so called master of qigong, and the the, the guy announced. That he, he called, you know, uh, rub his, his back on on the ring, and on the ring they they it was full of broken glass, and he said because of his chi he will, you know, no problem, he will not bleed, uh, and and it didn't make any no influence on him, and I saw this guy just, and suddenly he stood up, the blood was flowing from his back, and he went to the ring and he. Perhaps he fainted, <laughs> and, that, and and you know the, the the but the most interesting thing is not it's not this. I was with Amer with my American friend, and you know all the, the it was in uh, I remember very well it was in 1976, uh, and so when it finished, all the guy around us we were the only two friends. Oh, you don't hear me. Do you what's, hear? What's his name? My American friend. I was with an American friend. Yes, yes, I and, heard. Uh, you. And 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 so we were the only foreigners. So all the people around us, they look at us and they said, "Oh, that's not the real Qigong." And it was okay. It was okay. We understood that it was a matter of face, face losing, mm. and you have to. For me, and I think it's very important because I've seen that in 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 many ways. Uh, like you said, these people were lacking so much respect from the cult. Those people who are the those scholars, those people who know how to write, so they had to invent, to build up a discourse with words, 
which sounded very deep, deep thinking. Because they, 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 especially in the 19th century, when they started to, to have uh, scholars as their students, and when you, 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 you look at, for example, Jen Manching, it, 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 it was a, it, it was a, a, a good example. Uh, I have practiced fighting with a, with a, a former bodyguard of, of the Zhang Jingguo, and he really despised Jen Manching. And I said, why you despise Jen Manchin? Because he's very famous in, in, in Taiwan and all over the world for his skill. And I, I've pushed with, I mean, his guy, they, 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 great, great pushes. He said, yeah, you know, he came to us and he, wa he wanted to teach us what, it, what was fighting, but we are military and we, we taught him a lesson. But this guy, you know, and you could feel the hate between those military and the scholars. Because definitely Jen Manching had, had, had great skill. We, we can see that. Uh, but the fact that he was a scholar, these guys were reacting, reacting that, you know, for generation, my ancestors, you you spit, you spat on us. And and but I am in my field. I am in something, I'm the best. Scholar are not gonna teach me how to how how, how to fight. Yeah. And, and so I think they build up a system of thinking that they borrowed from the, the internal alchemy, uh, they borrowed from Taoism to get some respect. So that's the reason why I say, I say to my students, be careful with all these notion uh, because this is a very specific discourse. Uh, and I don't think this discourse, in terms of matters who are real, fit your practice. But it's good to know, and it's good to have different versions. It's good to have information about that. But don't get trapped into that, uh, because uh, because you're not you're not going to walk on the water. So so this this discourse is very interesting, and I really deeply appreciate what you're bringing to it. And I and I feel like we we can't get to the end of this. So I, we might have to end and have another discussion. Um, yes, because tomorrow, we, tomorrow morning, I have to work early. <laughs> we, we can put it up for a few weeks, but uh, yeah, it's very late for you. Um, and, but I really appreciate what you're saying. I, I, I actually have a very strong disagreement with you on this issue, but, uh, but I think, you know, but it, it's not it's not easy to articulate and i have not i have written about it to some extent uh, it's not it's not so easy to explain in a short period of time and it, it, it so and i have written about it but i have more to say like i have a lot more to say about this subject that i haven't yet finished articulating but it's it's but i i i have been practicing uh the golden elixir i um uh, for for almost 20 years now, I, I started practicing um, Zhou Wang, sitting and forgetting, the teacher who presumably learned from in Taiwan, um, Liu Ming. And, and he also taught the golden elixir, although he was not really a golden elixir, you know, a Jin Don practitioner per se, but it was part of ritual. So he, he, did, he did teach it. And in, in other words, I got the transmission, but I had to discover it myself. So my view is somewhat idiosyncratic because I am a martial artist, right? And, and so I, I don't know that I'm going to have a conversation with everyone, like with what other people have said or what other people are writing is not necessarily going to line up with my view. But my own view and my own use of vocabulary fits perfectly with with push hands there is no there's no separation the all that vocabulary you're using works exactly with what i'm doing so but but this is difficult in a discourse because we have to go so what does this word mean what does this word mean what does this word mean do you have this experience do you have this experience you know this is uh, not so easy to do and uh and of course I understand this this view of uh, you know people are hurt by long term 
future belief in walking on water, this is that this critique of religion is leg, legitimate critique. Um, and I, uh, I'm not doing that. Um, but uh, I, I also think one thing to add, because what you said about the discourse is true. It's, it's, it's true and very relevant. Um, but I think there's another part, which is that uh, the comic element. I think a lot of Tai Chi in push hands is sexual in nature. It has a sexual, um, sexual metaphors. And this is, this is hidden. People aren't, aren't, aren't discovering it. It's why they're separating. The, one reason they're now separating the language is because the, the implication is sexual. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh -huh. So that taboo that I, you know, just to say it briefly, you know, if two two people are practicing push hands, um, the one who fa jing first, the one who loses, the one <laughs> the one who releases their sperm first loses. So it's like a sexual metaphor. You know who who is going to show themselves first who is going to release first and so it, it uh, but, yeah. but but then why why the one who is fetching first will lose they don't not they don't necessarily the, the one who fudgings first could win but there's a reversal right this is a con basic concept of the golden elixir uh though that ideally the one who fa jings first loses because you because i use your jing against you okay that, that's that's where we are <laughs> <laughs> hey it's so much a pleasure to talk to you and and i i hope we can talk again and and i think i do not underestimate the people at large the, the people want to hear this they just haven't heard the whole picture I think people do want to learn, and I think they're capable of understanding, even if they don't read all the books. <laughs> and I and I and, I and and I will I will uh, I think I will put this on on YouTube, and add some uh, links on the bottom. So, yeah, any any links you want to send me uh, about books, uh, uh, you, I've written them down most of them, but um, it really. An incredible pleasure to talk to you. I mean, I me too. You know, we 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 used to say in my in my place, pleasure shared, pleasure multiplied. We say it again, pleasure shared. Pleasure shared, pleasure multiplied. Yes. <laughs> okay. Hey. <laughs> hey. Good night. Hey, if you like that video, don't forget to subscribe and watch the other ones. Also, check out my book, Tai Chi Bagua Zhang and the Golden Elixir, Internal Martial Arts Before the Boxer Uprising. And you can also find me at northstarmartialarts.com. Thanks.